Morning, everyone. My name is Chris Lopez. I'll be your host on this webinar today. So my background is I'm a realtor over at Your Castle Real Estate and one of the guys that runs DenverInvestmentRealEstate.com. So this is our monthly roundup webinar for the month of September. If you're new to it, think of it as a virtual cup of coffee while we sit around and talk real estate and talk about what happened in the last month or so around the Denver real estate market. So no specific agenda until a couple days before we start the webinar. Uh, Charles and I, and sometimes special guests, will talk about it, uh, review some deals, talk about the topics. But most importantly, we want it to be an interactive conversation. So please you know, email us in questions beforehand. You can always email me, chris at denverinvestmentrealestate.com, or any time throughout this webinar, go into the questions panel and type it in there, and Charles and I will get to those questions. And I know it's always hard to make live events on a consistent basis, so we will do it live every month, but if you can't make it live, please catch the recording. And if you go to denverinvestmentrealestate.com slash podcast9, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, the number nine, you can access recording in two ways. You can actually watch the, the video recording, we'll upload to YouTube, um, or you can download the audio version of the call and listen to it on your iPhone or whatever while you're out and about on a podcast channel. So I know an, listening to an hour-long recording can be a tough thing to get through while on your YouTube, so that's why I upload to the podcast channel. So I don't care which way you take it. Hopefully, one of those media formats works out well for you. So again, denverinvestmentrealestate.com slash podcast9 to get access to the recording of this one, and plus you'll see the recordings of all the other, uh, other podcast webinars on there as well. So my co-host today is Charles Roberts, who many of you know. Uh, he is the president of Your Castle Real Estate, the president of Live Urban Real Estate, and actually, what, about a week ago, Charles, you're the president of a new real estate company too, right, Shorewood Real Estate? Uh, yes, we acquired uh, Shorewood Real Estate that has offices in Colorado Springs, Denver, and Loveland. So we brought on about 260 agents, and it's been a fun-filled last eight days. Great. So let's just jump into the topics for this week. And I think the best way to actually know what's going on with the market is to let's just talk about some deals. And let me pull up the first deal. And these are real live deals. These aren't, you know, what if case studies or what if scenarios. These are deals that uh, are actually recently closed or are under contract to be closed. So this first one, see the background on this, I'll read you the broker's description here, just so everyone can understand it. So public remarks. Price reduced, price reduced. Don't miss this fantastic opportunity to own a rare three bedroom, one bathroom condo with laminate flooring, great location, close to Belmar Shopping Mall, schools, restaurants, and walking distance to public line of transportation. New paint and new carpet. Instead of paying rent, you could own this amazing condo. And this is actually in Lakewood, so it's a 3 1 condo in Lakewood. Uh, now, Charles, I'll kind of turn it over to you to give us the rundown and talk about what happened on this deal. Uh, sure. This one was uh, actually on East Florida in uh, Lakewood. And um, they actually had started, I think this thing goes back to May. They put it on the market for about 195000 and it was just simply overpriced. Um, you know, it's a, it's a B minus complex, you know, not exactly lovey-dovey kind of stuff uh, you can see from the outside. It's, it's okay, but it's nothing luxurious. Uh, but uh, my guy was looking for solid cash flow long-term properties, and this one just had great numbers. It was a three-bedroom, one bath. Uh, it was, uh, the asking price was 171 when we took a look at it, and the numbers basically break down till we got it for 165. We did an inspection. It was in pretty good shape. Um, but um, we got a little bit off and uh, just you know got it for about that price. And you have the numbers in front of you. What was the final cap rate on this thing? The final cap rate Oops. Yeah, it was a 9 3. Which was just actually you know pretty damn phenomenal. I mean, we were very, very happy with it. Um, 
that that nine three would be if he was managing it himself. I think he may end up actually using uh, Grace Property Management to rent it in management. So call it about a, probably about an eight eight once he has the I think it's eight and a half percent property management fee. But I'll tell you, I mean, this was out there and anybody could have had this. We didn't do anything too tricky. We just looked at it. Uh, had a buyer who knew what he wanted, looking for long-term stuff, and that's what he got. Um, in terms of the lending, this was non-warrantable, so we couldn't get a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, normal type of loans, no problem. We get a local lender. He worked with John Wilms at First Bank. Um, numbers were great. Uh, I think, I'm trying to think what he got. Might have been like a 7-1 arm at maybe four and three quarters, something like that. So not a long-term 15 or 30 year loan, but the numbers are so small, he was fine with it. He's gonna get this thing paid off. And you know, um, you know, like mid eight cap with property management, nine three if you do it yourself, who says you can't find deals out there? We closed this one uh, two days ago. Wow, so annual cash flow before taxes, $5,500. And that's with the PM fee in there, wow. Yeah, so uh, this is a three bedroom, one bath. It's a comfortable three one. Um, we're, we haven't rented it yet. Uh, the seller was telling me based upon what he was seeing in the property management, he thinks we'll probably get about 1700 um, over a thousand square feet. Section eight. I love section eight. Lots and lots of section eight tenants looking for places. So that's based on a section eight, which is what we think it's going to be. So maybe check back next month when we can see what he actually got but he's already had some interest in it and that's our best guess what we think the rent will be. Could be higher, could be potentially lower, but I think 1700, that's what he thinks, that's what the property manager is telling him and that jibes with what I know of that market. So let me ask you a few questions about the price because I was actually looking through the, uh, let me go back to the MLS sheet on here. I don't know if, uh, yeah, that's right, property. So looking over here at the price sheet, so end of May was listed at 195, and he said it was overpriced then, right? Well, by definition, I mean, put your cursor up and like that's what the market tells us. So it's, yeah. it's a very interesting thing to talk about. Uh, among other things, I'm an appraiser and that just means, you know, I learn how to be an appraiser. I pass the test, that kind of stuff. And it's, it's hard if there aren't any comps to actually price a property correctly. Now, this is a complex that probably should have had some comps. I don't know why she came in this high. The seller wanted to try. So she came in and may... Uh, May 26 of 17 at 195 and the market told her that it was priced too high. So look at all the price decreases. Yeah, so June 9th, 195 to 189. July 5th, 189 to 184. July 21st, 185 to 179. It was actually withdrawn. Put back on the market early August. Withdrawn again. And then uh, decreased from 179 to 174. So what did you guys come in here? Did you come in when it was listed at 174? Like how did you get down to the 165 price? Or is your story behind that? No, we came in when it was, yeah, we came in when it was at 175, 171. So they dropped it as you see on the top from 174 to 171. And I'm trying to remember, to be honest, I can't remember if we came in at I, I can't remember if we actually came in at 165 and they took it or we came in a little bit lower and we met at 165. But the bottom line is public records. We bought it for 165. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um. You know, so let me let me reiterate, this is not a place that a lot of people on this webinar would necessarily want to live. To be honest, I have low expectations of life. I'd live there. I don't care. Everybody was nice to me there. But, you know, no, you know, you might not want to live there, but you're not going to live there. Something would have to go really, really wrong if you buy this as an investment property and end up living there. But someone's going to live there. And I'll tell you, these are nicer units than I owned back during the downturn 10, 12 years ago when we had 13% vacancy rate. These are nicer than what I had. And I kept my places full because I worked really, really hard. So someday when the market turns, the vacancy rates will go up and it'll be harder to rent these. We know that for sure. But I also know that I've rented harder places than this. And I'm quite confident if you stay on the ball, you'll be able to keep these rented. Nice. And what does the interior look like? Uh, is it updated or kind of what's, what's the interior look like? Do you remember? It was nice. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like fix and flip nice, but basically ready to go rental nice. Um, I think he's gonna maybe have the carpets cleaned. And I called him uh, the day after 
we closed just to check on the rent and he was actually at a Habitat picking up a couple of appliances. It had appliances, but he's like, what the heck, I'll spend $300 and get a, a nicer stove and a clean fridge. Um, my, I think I put in here, uh, if you go down a little bit, yeah, right there, initial repair cost. I estimated 1000 I actually think that's quite a bit higher, but I always like to be conservative. The place is rentable. It's fine. It's, uh, you know, it wasn't like it was painted yesterday, but there's no need to paint it. It smelled fine. Maybe a little carpet cleaning, a couple of bright, shiny uh, appliances, and he will rent this. Fantastic. All right. And by the way, everybody out there, if you have any questions, um, you, can see, you can see that you can type in questions. We, we always love to answer questions. The harder, the better. Anything you have, uh, this is your time to jump in if you like. I was about to say, I'm surprised there's been no questions about the HOA yet. Um, but I mean, actually, HOA these what 25 for the year, so what's it like, 210 bucks a month, 220 bucks a month? Yeah, yeah it was it was like solid, pretty good for HOA. It was pretty, it was it was decent. There was nothing that we didn't like about it. You know, it's not like they have 10 million dollars in the bank, but there was nothing that worried us. First Bank does their you know you know look see at all the numbers, and they had no problem with it. They've also done loans here as well. They were great. I mean, it was just streamlined and easy. Um, just wasn't a complicated deal. So a couple of questions uh, rolling in here. Andrew asked you, Charles, you mentioned staying on the ball as far as keeping a unit rented. Can you elaborate? What does staying on the ball mean? How do you do that? Yeah. So, hey, Andrew. Um, so what I mean is I own 29 units when we had 13.4% vacancy rate back around 03, 04. And it was, a, it was a tough period because I had like D minus properties. They were just not good places. Staying in the ball means working hard. It means like not reading a book and thinking you know how to property manage. It means going out at 11 o'clock at night if you need to. It means hanging out at the Section 8 Denver Housing Authority office to, to pick up potential renters. It means doing a lot of work. That was the highest vacancy rate in Denver recorded history. And I swear I had the worst 29 units in town. So I definitely had to work hard and there's just no way around it. Today, you frankly don't have to work hard. I love today. 1% vacancy, being a property manager is so easy. Someday, years down the road, it'll get harder. And the basic answer is you'll have to work a lot harder. Feel free to check in with me and, and talk, and I'm happy to talk with you more about it. I just mean you've got to make um, a commitment to, to work hard, get tenants, answer your phone, do things you might not particularly want to, potentially have tenants you might not particularly want to, to get through that. That's kind of what I'm saying. And Jessica asked a couple questions. Um around Section 8, pros and cons to accepting Section 8, and how do you qualify a property for Section 8? Yeah, hey Jessica, good morning. Um, great question. So another long, long story, which feel free to give me a call. I'm happy to chat with you about. Um, people have very strong opinions. It's like politics, religion, and Section 8. You know, you love it, you <laughs> hate it. I happen to love it, and Section 8 really bailed me out of the downturn because I got really good at Section 8. Pros and cons. Um, the obvious pro is that you're going to get your rent, that some or all of your rent is going to come from the government. That's basically the pro. Cons, some would say, is that you have a lower element of tenant. Come back to me when you have 2,500 tenant months of managing your own units and tell me if you think that's true, because I do, and I don't necessarily think that's true. In my opinion, of course, I've had crazy Section 8 tenants, I've had great ones, I've had crazy non-Section 8 tenants, and I've had great ones, but for me, I actually like Section 8 a lot, because I know I'm going to get the rent, and it's basically the same quality tenant as I usually get, and here's the story, the vast majority of tenants, if you treat them well, if you treat them like human beings, they treat you really well, because they're just not used to being treated well, and I know that goes against every guru and every book you ever read about make it a business and slap people around and you know never actually try to do the right thing, but um, I think if you do the right thing, you actually can make more money. So Daniel asks, does the 5% for repairs and maintenance account for CapEx and is that figure lower because it's an HOA ran condo unit? Yeah, exactly. So uh, CapEx or capital expenses. And the answer is yes. And by the way, I'm glad you brought that up, Daniel, because there's just no science around that 5%. Mostly you hang around with people who've done it for 20 years and they kind of shrug their shoulders. I'm like, I don't know. It's, you know, maybe it's a hundred bucks a month or something like that. Like it, it tends to be the newer people 
who are focus and obsess on numbers thinking that that's what it'll be. And it's the old fogies who go, yeah, you know, I had to buy a new furnace a couple years ago, something like that. So we throw out numbers like five, six, seven percent to put aside for capital expenses as well as painting, carpet, stuff like that. Um, but you bring up a really good point. Is it lower because it's a condo? And the answer is absolutely. So if you have a duplex built in 1954, other things being equal, I would say you probably want to set aside more money because you have the roof to pay for. Whereas in a condo, that's coming out of your HOA, assuming they're putting money into a reserve funds. So one of the things I do like about attached, there's pros and cons, but one of the things I like is that um, that 5%, that number is generally lower on an attached unit when you have HOA funds going to pay for some of your uh, exterior capital expenses. Great question. All right, so let's move on to our second deal here. And guys, just keep the questions rolling. This is exactly the format we want. Just keep firing the questions away. So this, okay, and so this property we're just moving off of, Charles, it just closed earlier this week, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I closed both of these uh, within the last three days, so Wednesday okay. and Thursday this week. So I asked that question, Charles, just to show you guys, you're not going to get any more of a current real snapshot of the Denver market than two properties closing in the past seven days. So this next property, here are the public remarks from the listing broker. Cherry Creek School District, easy access to Cherry Creek shopping area, to downtown Denver and DTC. Well-maintained end unit overlooking the large park-like courtyard. Secure building with electronic key access. Heat and water are included in the HOA dues. Indoor and outdoor swimming pools, jacuzzi, weight room, billiard room, clubhouse, tennis, and volleyball court. And... What is the monthly HOA fee on here? Do you remember that, Charles? Yeah, it sounds like really all of that. You two or something? It's unbelievable, actually. I say I, want, I might want to move into this place. Uh, let's see here. Let's pull up the numbers on here. Oh wow! So for the year they're at nineteen forty-four. Wow, that's really inexpensive. Yeah, it is. So uh, oh, so this is a two-bedroom, two-bathroom condo in Aurora. So, Charles, that lets you kind of go into details now. Yeah, and I apologize. It's actually Denver, um, and it's a terrible thing to say, but you probably got that from me because it sort of feels like Aurora. Awful, awful, but it actually is Denver. Um, so, uh, this property. So, yes, it's in Cherry Creek Schools, but it's just not <laughs> – it's not like what you think of Cherry Creek Schools, even though it is there. It's very actually similar to the first one we talked about. Just, um, you know, uh, long hallways and not exactly the people you're going to hang out all day, every day. It's an apartment complex. But, God, the numbers were great. There's money in the HOA, really, really inexpensive HOA fee. Um, they actually, you know, had done some painting so the hallways look great. It actually has a pool that looks like a you know, like a Holiday Inn, like it has a real pool, real workout room, and um, we've had no trouble. I actually have two under contract with two different buyers in this complex. I'm closing the other one on a 1031. Guy's got a bunch of money, so we're 1031ing into some stuff, and he got this one as well. This is another one that just the cash flow was great. I mean, just there's nothing not to like about it. It's pretty so simple, here the... simple property as far as we can tell. Oh, so let me read off the numbers since I know it can be hard to read. So uh, 2 2 condo in Denver for the final closing price was 123.5? Yeah, they, um, it was at, I think they were asking 130 something. We came in at one, whatever, we got it under contract for 125. They had a few inspection things. We went back and forth a couple times and they took 1500 bucks off. I mean, I don't know what she bought it for, the seller, but she probably bought it for like 40000 So she made some great money and we're happy with it. Yeah, so the history huh, doesn't go back that far. So then any initial repairs they have to do, or is it ready to go? It's pretty much ready to go. Um, with that 1500 I'm trying to think. It was uh, – I remember thinking that I, I don't think I would have done anything. The stove was maybe a little dirty, so maybe you'd take it out, maybe you'd clean it. But they've already – they already have people who want to rent it. So there's nothing you have to do. And like everything in real estate, there are very few black and whites. Some people would come in here and maybe they paint the whole thing. I would think that's crazy because I can rent it tomorrow and not paint it. And it's in almost perfect condition, not 
perfect, but almost perfect. So um, I don't know what they're going to do, but I'm guessing they're probably going to do nothing. Okay, so they put about 30000 down. It's probably roughly all investment out. Do you know it's a third-year long-term financing they did? Yeah, so this is where it gets really interesting, uh, and this is a whole other big topic that we should talk about on a future webinar. So they are using funds from a HELOC. It's actually two guys, um, you know, who are business partners on this, and they're they're using HELOC money, and they're going to take advantage of a of a concept called paycheck parking, um, which is a really really interesting and powerful way to pay off a property sooner. Uh, so we talked about this. He asked me what I thought, and I said, hey, go check out these like 18 webinars and other stuff that I've been doing uh, with a colleague of mine, Matt Pilmore from VIP Financial, because we've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, Matt has a company in town called VIP Financial who helps people do this in a really sophisticated way. They're doing it in a very rudimentary way, but they're essentially using HELOCs, putting their paychecks into the HELOCs, and the numbers are just amazing about how quickly you can pay off properties just doing it like that. So if you want more information, touch base, and maybe we do a future webinar, maybe we'll try to get Matt on these, but it's, uh, I'm glad they're doing it because they're going to build a lot of wealth doing this. What do, what's the, uh, I know the spreadsheet is not designed to do that calculation, but is this made pay off five years, eight years? What's it looking like? Do you yeah, remember? I, I've been making it up. I mean, I can't okay. remember, but I'm guessing it's probably in the six to eight years as opposed to a 30 year. Um, if they if they follow the basic attributes of putting their income into the um, basically using the HELOC as it like a checking account. Um, and if you want any information, let me know. I can send you a great white paper from a gentleman I don't know, uh, but they actually sent me this white paper and said, what do you think? I'm like, well, I can tell you what I think. I, I know a lot about this. And it's it's something that everybody should look into to see if it makes sense for you, but it it's very powerful. Uh, is that white paper something we could post to the website or, or do you want you know, to keep that so. email only? It's a guy's white paper, and I mean, I think he would be very happy, you know, so we, we should put information up there on this, um, and it's, you know, it's a PDF, so I, they sent it to me. I don't see why I can't send it to someone else. Like, he has a business out of state. I don't know who he is, but he's actually a quite a good writer. I read the whole 90 pages of it, and he, he explains the concept, and it works. It just actually works. I know we've been doing it for 10 years. Okay. Well, I'm interested in reading it myself, so I will get that from you, Charles, and post it with the recording. For everyone that's interested, a couple of questions rolling in here. Uh, Andrew asked, is the 4.75 mortgage rate we're showing on the, on the spreadsheet, is that a reflection of the buyer or the investment-related mortgage uh, mortgage product? I don't know the difference. I don't know. Uh, help me out here, Chris. I'm not sure. On the buyer? I think uh, I'm not quite mortgage sure the question is. I'm assuming Maybe. like I, I, I think he means I mean, the 4.75 is a uh, – uh, the current rates for a 30 or fixed roughly, right? Yeah, no, he, yeah, he explains it here. He says you, I answered already. So I think what he's asking oh. is that, that 475, what it would have been on a 30 year fixed or what their HELOC was. And the answer is what it would have been because I want to do apples to apples. So I'm showing you if he had gotten, he probably would have gotten something like a 30 year fixed four and three quarter from, say, First Bank because this is also non warrantable. But because they're using their HELOC, it's very different. The rate is probably lower, but the real difference is using paycheck parking to pay off the HELOC, fa HELOC, uh, HELOC faster. So hopefully that's not too confusing. The, the, the short answer is that 4.75% is what it would have been had he gotten a 30-year fixed. All right. Yeah, he says we did answer it. So just going off those numbers, I realize we never went to the cash flow section. Uh, with those numbers of doing a 30-year fix to keep it apples to apples, is this, uh, about 5000 a year cash flow before taxes. Wow, that's good. 17% cash on cash return and a 9-1 cap rate. And I guess, are they self-managing, do you know, Charles? They are self-managing, yep. Um, all yeah, right. so it's... They're all, they're all, so as a matter of fact, believe it or not, they're there right now um, showing it to people. So I, I would be surprised if they didn't have it rented by tomorrow, Sunday. Um, yeah, they are self-managing. And I'll tell you, I've actually shown these units before over, not these particular ones, but these types of units in this complex 
you know, for a long period of time. And these are the first I got on the contract. A lot of people looked at him and said, this isn't where I want to own. You know, they find it a little too scary for them. Totally respect that. So we go to other parts of town, nicer areas, you know, and they get more like a 7.5 cap instead of this pretty extraordinary 9 cap. And, you know, the answer is there's no right answer. It's whatever's right for you. I just, by coincidence, I had two clients who wanted them at the same time. So we got two under contract. So Charles, I got to ask you, you the ultimate litmus test question for you. Would you be comfortable walking around your 10 pound shih tzu, shih tzu dog there at, at, at night? You know, I, I would, but that's a reflection of me. For whatever reason, I don't know, people don't bother me and I don't bother people. So literally, the reason Chris is asking is I told him 20 years ago when I started investing in Southwest Denver, my litmus test was I would take my little, my little Shih Tzu Maddie and I would go on a Friday night at like nine o'clock and I would walk around and just see what would happen to me. You know, like that's how I felt like, you know, maybe I won't die doing this. So I'm not joking. That's what I did with my properties. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, th this is a nicer area than a lot that I've owned, but that's me. Yeah. Um, I'm just amazed that HOA includes electricity and heat for, what, less than $200 a month. That's great. Uh, so Chris asked a question here. Uh, do you know, do you get charged additional fees for using the HELOC? your home equity line of credit as a checking account. Do you know the answer to that, Charles? I'm 98% certain no. Um, I've never actually had anybody ask that question, but it's a HELOC. So the answer is, I'm almost certain the answer is no, uh, with the caveats that every bank has HELOCs and they get to decide what they want to do. So it comes down to the bank. I don't believe so. Um, no. And Rachel asks, if you change the mortgage terms, won't it change the cap rate significantly? So let's change. Um, well, no. By definition, cap rate is the net operating income divided by the purchase price. So the mortgage wouldn't be a part of it. It would absolutely change cash on cash and um, uh, return on investment and other numbers. But in this case, using the paycheck parking methodology, we're looking at paying it off literally many, many years sooner. So Rachel, absolutely send me an email so I can send you this document and you can learn about it to talk to your clients and maybe yourself as well, because it's a very, very simple, easy and legitimate way to accelerate a loan. There's way deeper uh, complexities to it if you want to, but it can be simple. But the bottom line is the cap rate doesn't change because the cap rate is the assumption that you own it outright anyhow. So just to show you here, so I just plugged in, so they paid off in eight years, HELOC maybe at a three and a half interest rate, probably lower, but let's just show those numbers. Cap rate's still a nine one, but it's showing a negative 10% cash or cash on cash return. I mean, kind of have to ignore that with those numbers, but cap rate is exactly the same. Right, because cap rate assumes that you own the property outright so that you can compare property to property to property without bringing in the variable of a loan. It's a really effective way to compare properties. If you want to get what your long-term return on investment is or IRR, whatever number, another way to do it is bringing the loan in. But cap rate's effective to compare properties without thinking about the loan. All Great right, moving on. Yeah, guys, keep these coming. This is great. And my computer is not cooperating with me. Give me one second. Um, so, Charles, moving to the next topic, there is something called the Denver Investor Success Summit happening in about a month on Saturday, October 28th. What is it? Um, so about seven and a half years ago, um, myself and my buddies from Pine Financial just sort of sat down and said, you know, we've been teaching lots of one and two hour classes. Let's do something bigger. And we put together something we call the Investor Success Summit. This will be our 15th one. We do them every six months. And it's a, it's a full day of training. Thanks for pulling that up. It's a full day of training. We have it at the PA, PA Center. And, and here's the deal. Like, unlike every other summit and seminar and stuff you go to, just nobody is going to sell you anything. We have about 20 vendors who 
essentially pay for it for us, and we charge $19 for the full day of training, right, less than $20, uh, and we actually buy you drinks afterwards, and it's just us and our colleagues and people we know who are the best in the industry, local people, talking about lots of different topics. We don't fly gurus in, no books and tapes, just none of that crap. It's just us and our colleagues and the best in the business. And Rachel, who's on here, actually, I believe we presented in the last one, and you talked about um, uh, short-term rentals, and you were awesome. And um, I suggest you come to it. It's great. You register here. You can go to send me an email. I can send it to you. Whatever, whatever you need to do, you can pre-register. It's 19 bucks, and you know we get the feedback, and I go through the feedback, and it's just it's wonderful because it. It's our opportunity to meet more people, to give more. And you know why we do that? Because we get more when we give more. So if you haven't come to it, um, come. I think you'll like it. And the website is denverisss.com. So ISS as Investor Success Summit. Yep. And if you want to know more about it, as always, feel free to reach out to me. So our next topic. So this will be a fun one. So I think it was on Thursday. So like two days ago, Courtney emailed me over a question. She's looking to buy her first investment property and has been running some numbers and, you know, just bouncing some ideas around to get other people's inputs on helping her analyze the deal. So Courtney, I think you said you can make the webinar. If you're able to, I think I can bring you live on here. I don't see you on here. If you are, send us a message. Yeah, if you're on here, let me know, Courtney. Otherwise, I will start giving you the rundown of the property because Charles has not seen this property yet, so it's a totally new thing for him to look at as well, which should be uh, even more fun. All right, so this is a single-family home. It's a three-bedroom, three-bath. I think it was about 2,200 square feet, and it's in southeast Aurora, it's near the Aurora Reservoir, so just east of 470. And she's looking to do a buy and hold. So just nothing fancy, just buy it 20% down, rent it out, and hold on to it for the long term. She's able to get it for about $350,000 with comps in the 400 to 420 range. So it sounds like she's actually getting this at this, you know, at a discount which makes things even better. So let me pull up the spreadsheet and we'll start looking through the numbers. Let's see, where is that spreadsheet? Okay, so I'm gonna show you two spreadsheets because she emailed me one that was a CCIM spreadsheet and I'll show it to you real fast just to look at it and I put the data in Joe's spreadsheet so we have more of like an apples to apples comparison. Uh, Charles, you want me to run through the CCM spreadsheet or should we just go straight to Joe's, do you think? Because I know this one is loaded with information, the CCM one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, um, I, I actually prefer Joe's, and anybody who's ever listened to me hears me say that. Um, the CCIM one, I use and I got my CCIM, I understand it, but I think it's more complicated than 99% of what we need for. So I'd go to Joe's, I think it's simpler. All right, let me just go pull that up. So we're done with that one. All right, so here we go. Uh, cash flow analysis for Courtney's 3-3 single family home. So purchase price at 350, 20% uh, down, so it's about a $70,000 down payment. I don't believe it needs any initial repairs, so it'd be about $75,000 total investment. And uh, she knows what she'll be getting for rent, so this makes it a lot easier. And interesting, interestingly, she said the renter she has in place is willing to go in and prepay the next 18 months' worth of rent at $2,500 per month. So nice little cherry on top there. So that would be an annual rent of $30,000, and she's doing a 4% vacancy, and she's estimating the expenses at $3,700 in taxes, $1,800 in property insurance, and she's doing $2,500 in repairs and maintenance. So, um, you know, so one month's worth of rent. And I believe this is a fairly new build house. I looked up the address, I think it was built in the last 10 years. So, you know, it's not a 1960s house that has a lot of deferred maintenance. So, should be pretty light on the repairs. 
So that puts the total annual expenses at 8,000. And then with the net operating income, less the mortgage payments gives her $4,200 a month in a before tax cash flow. 6% cash on cash return and a 5.9 cap rate. So Charles, digest that and what's your initial reaction here? What are your initial thoughts? I know it's a very complicated thing. You can't just say, yes, buy it, no, don't buy it. But if you have a client bring this to you, what's the thought process you go through on helping them analyze the deal, see if it's the right fit for their portfolio? Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. At this price range, 350000 or so for a single family, you're looking at about a six cap. So can you get better caps? Yes, but is the right property for you? Are you reducing your risk because you have 18 uh, months prepaid with a great tenant, right? That's where you can't put an Excel spreadsheet. Half art, half science. So the science part, the 5.9 cap, I say, if you're good with that, great, but you can certainly do better. But this is a nice house, probably in a nice neighborhood with a solid tenant. You can take that money that you get 18 months at 2,500, maybe invest that elsewhere. You know, maybe you can buy a second property for that kind of stuff. So I would say it comes down to what is right for you. The Excel spreadsheet doesn't tell us what's right. It's, it's you deciding what's right for you. And a couple other things just to kind of keep in mind, I'm, I'm recalling my emails back and forth with her. As I said, this is her first property. So I think she's looking for something that's easy within her comfort zone as well. And that kind of goes to that half art you're talking about, Charles, which hey, makes it a lot easier if you're comfortable with the property. It's what you know makes it an easier investment. And you know, my attitude is in you know, 20 or 30 years, having a nice house in a growing part of Denver, I don't think you're going to be worried too much if you bought a six cap 30 years ago versus a seven cap. I mean, yeah, and back yeah. to the science part, you know, we can actually show you what the difference would be and then take an estimate of appreciation and final internal rate of return. So your, your total return over the period of time. But a better way of saying is you buy property, you hold it for 20 years, you get rich. It doesn't matter if it's a six or a seven, you're going to get rich. So, you know, do you want to put your money into this property and you hold it for a long time? I, I can practically promise you're going to be really glad you did it in 20 years. So I had a, a question I want to pull up from that she asked me, and this is for you, Mr. CCIM. Um, so she's buying this property at a discount. I don't know uh, where she's getting this deal from, but as I said, she's getting it for about 350 and comps are in the 400 to 420 range. And she said, why doesn't the cap rate reflect the value of the higher comps surrounding this property? The cap rate's whatever you want it to be. So if she were to ask me that question, I would say, look, if you want the cap rate to be a five because the purchase price is 420, fine. That's just not how you know people do it. So you can do whatever you want if that's what you want. But if you were to say this cap rate was a five, because you're using 400,000, I would say, well, you know, look up the definition of a cap rate. That's not the common definition of a cap rate, but if that's how you want to use it, you know, knock yourself out and use it that way. If you want to kind of get more, uh, you know, I, I had my brief stint in the commercial apartment world for a couple months uh, a while back. And I mean, a common way that they would use cap rates is, you know, people would buy these value add apartment buildings where they come in and whether they do a complete renovation or just, you know, go in there and clean up the property and, and raise the rents from a landlord that was significantly below, below market rents for the last 20 years because he was buddy buddies with his tenants. They'd buy the property, literally come in, raise the rents, and then the not, net operating income changes, then they could raise the value of the house and the cap rate changes. So you can do some really interesting stuff with there and making it fit whatever you want, as Charles was saying. Right. And that's exactly what we do. Uh, some of my clients want to pursue more of that strategy where they want to be able to come in and buy something at a higher cap um, and add value to it, raise the purchase price, which, if you think about the math, reduces or uh, I'm sorry, rate, you know, makes the return larger and increases the cap rate. So under having a basic understanding of how these things work. Um, can help you make some decisions on what you want to do and how you want to play it. So Andrew was asking, was this house purchased with a conventional 30-year mortgage? Uh, I believe it was. Looking at the spreadsheet 
she sent over to me, it was uh, she had 30 years in there at a 4.25 interest rate. Oh, so Tanya here is playing a uh, a what if scenario? Why not just flip this property? I mean, that's a good question, and I don't have the answer. That's uh, you know something for Courtney to think about. If the counts are going for four twenty five, yeah, could probably make a quick fifty thousand dollars off of there. Right, but if she, you know, she might have to pay thirty percent of that in short term gains, you know, so that would be, you know, she'd walk away with thirty five thousand. Well, that's a great day. But she could argue that in 20 years, she might make 800000 on this property if it goes up 5 or 6%, et cetera, et cetera. So the good news is there's probably no bad option when you buy a property if it's truly undervalued that much, which, you know, I'd actually want to look into the numbers to make sure that that's the case in the condition it is. But once you have a property that has equity, um, you know, anything is going to work for you. It just depends on what your business is and what you want to do with it. So another question from Rachel, uh, she says, can you explain the five year after tax return? How does this factor into an investing? So I think Rachel, you're referring to uh, on Joe's spreadsheet, the cash flow tab, yeah. this line down here that says the five year after tax return. I believe that's the internal rate of return, right, Charles? Well, actually, I'll let you explain that line. Yeah, it is. Um, so briefly, because, you know, again, we don't have too much time, and Rachel, we can talk more about it. This would be analogous to the internal rate of return after tax, assuming whatever tax uh, rate this person is in. And we think I think they put we put a high tax rate for them. So what this is analogous to is if you put a dollar into U.S. bank, you'll get 1% a year and then take off the taxes. If you had this type of property after five years after tax, you'd have 21%. And it, that's exactly what internal rate of return is, is factoring all the, um, the variables that you can put into it, meaning rent and rent appreciation and home and home appreciation if it does go up. You put in those variables, which of course are estimates and guesses for the next five years, but you, you use the numbers that you think are the most realistic. What percentage will you be making on your initial investment every year after tax? And that's what that number is. And uh, for you, Rachel, anyone else out there that wants to really get all the details of the spreadsheet, um, you can always come to the website, go to Courses Under Education, and watch this Denver Investment Property Analysis Spreadsheet course. It's the one with the house on the calculator. It's I think it's three videos totaling about 30 minutes worth of content where Charles and Joe go through the spreadsheet in detail. Uh, so it's a great, great uh video to study a few times to get all the ins and outs, the details of the spreadsheet. All right, so keep the questions coming in. I'm going to actually uh, change gears here for a minute because I actually want to pick Charles's brain, anyone else out there listening to this, on a, a few ideas on taking I'll say more the investing approach to buying a primary residence. And I know it's very hard to put the, you know, you can't really combine the two, but, you know, everyone on this webinar and listening to the recording, you guys are have the investor's mindset of, okay, you know, a dollar spent is a dollar I can't invest in a property. And I always think of it, what's the balance of spending a dollar or spending a certain amount of money on something I need now from a personal standpoint, you know, and that's kind of the whole finding the optimal return of money spent versus, uh, you know, I'll say functionality and family happiness. And so the reason I'm asking this is because, you know, I'm buying a house for the first time as like a family person. Got a wife, just had her first kid, or just had her first baby. So buying a house is a, with that different perspective is completely new to me. And for the most part, with my background for up until very recently, uh, my previous businesses, 100% internet-based, 100% geographical. I could be anywhere I wanted to. So I rented, and I would literally move every 8 to 12 months, often from like one city to one city or from one coast to the other coast. Just I was really enjoying the freedom that I had from those businesses. 
Um, and I always kind of valued, okay, I'm going to stick with renting. It was simple. I didn't want to be tied down anywhere, just nothing to tie me down. I could always, you know, worst case scenario, I'd break a lease and lose $2,000. And, you know, I did a couple times to move. And so I always kind of had these basic formulas I used when I looked at renting a place. Okay, I'm going to spend $1,000 a month or $1,500 a month. And I'd often kind of rent nicer places uh, because I was working from home. So I was spending oftentimes 20 to 21 to 22 hours a day inside the place. So I wanted to be somewhere that was comfortable and actually have a little, at least a nook for a home office so I could do my work, uh, but also wanted to make sure I could enjoy it. And so I'd always do different calculations since I wasn't commuting to an office every day. I used to do a very basic calculation of looking at the IRS's standard mileage deduction. And for those of you that aren't familiar with this, if you're self-employed or business owner, uh, anytime you're driving somewhere for business, one method to write off your car expenses is this standard mileage deduction. And the IRS changes it every year based on gas prices and other factors. But essentially they say in 2017, every mile you drive is worth 54 cents. And that's for maintenance, gas, insurance, uh, just everything with maintaining a car. So I'd often calculate that, okay, I'm not commuting, or if I want to be in a certain location to, so I could walk to places, because I even spent a couple of years without a car, because I was centrally located, didn't have to commute, so I had no car for a couple of years. So I'd always calculate, hey, you know what, I'm saving $500 a month, that's $500 more a month I can put towards, you know, my rent. So now I'm looking at it from a completely different angle, uh, from a purchasing standpoint, and a great opportunity we have is uh, my mother-in-law, who I actually get along great with. Um, you know, my wife and I just had her first kid. My wife is an only child. This is her, uh, my mother-in-law's first grandbaby, um, and she is offered and wants to move in with us. We love the idea because we're closer to family. We want our baby to have, you know, be surrounded by family, and of course. Uh, much more trust our mother-in-law to help things out with watching the baby versus a daycare. Uh, so lots of great benefits on here. So I've been running some numbers trying to figure out, okay, how much is this worth from a financial standpoint? And it's an incredibly tough question. So here are some basic numbers. You know, first off, she's not financially dependent on us, um, but for everyone's sanity and enjoyment, we need a property with ideally a true mother-in-law suite. So kind of if you think about, you know, the, the, the main house on the first floor and second floor, and then a walkout basement uh, with a kitchen down there, a living space, and then, you know, a, a essentially another master bedroom down there and master bathroom for my mother-in-law. So fortunately, she's not financially dependent on us, so we're not having to, you know, support her and support, you know, all the expenses. And so I started calculating, okay, well, that's probably going to be, $1,500 a month savings in daycare, and that's just me looking at the cost of daycare and doing a rough estimate of mileage back and forth and time spent picking and dropping, dropping our kid off. I know there'll be some savings in a combined household. You know, our utilities and some expenses will be cheaper, you know, since we have two houses living in one versus us living in two houses next door to each other, and just other benefits that I really can't put a value on, but I tried to throw an arbitrary number out there just, just to have something to work with. It's just the benefits of, you know what? She loves cooking and she's a great cook. I will certainly benefit from that. You know, she will help out with some errands. And overall, just that peace of mind of, hey, I can't pick up our daughter today or this came up. She'll be there to help out and take care of her for the most part. You know, how much is that worth? So I started playing around with some numbers. So I said $1,500 for daycare. $250 a month in household savings, $500 a month in like those other miscellaneous benefits. And probably that number should be higher if we were to like hire a live-in nanny. I think it'd be a lot higher, but I'm trying to be conservative and realistic. So Charles, any ideas on how you could calculate that into the value of a property? <laughs> I've got you know, one method I'm using. I want to ask you before I go into it. Yeah, I mean, what, I don't want to lead the witness. Yeah, I, I, I almost want you to lead the witness because this is where um, you have to balance 
the difficult thing to actually assess, which is wanting your child to be, you know, help partly brought up by her grandmother, you know, in a safe environment with the cash. I mean, what's that worth to you? Probably a lot. So why don't you dive in and let me comment? All right. So the, and so a little bit more backstory. So, you know, obviously buying a house with a mother-in-law suite is a bigger property and it's going to be more expensive because, you know, it already have a mother-in-law suite built in there or we'll buy a place with an unfinished basement and spend, I'm still getting estimates, you know, fifty dollars to $100,000 to finish it perhaps. So the only way I could think of it was taking the monthly savings, and what was the total there? So twenty two fifty is my back of the napkin math, which is not very accurate, saying, okay, well, and doing a reverse calculation, if I were to say, okay, twenty two fifty a month in a mortgage payment, how much house could that afford me? And I'll just put 4% interest rate in here. And if you guys can't see the screen, I've got a, a calculator that does like the reverse calculation of how much house can I afford. So a house payment of $22.50 a month at 4% interest rates, a $471,000 house. So that's on top of the house that we were already looking to buy ourselves. Now, obviously 30 years out is just, you know, too long in my mind to even have an accurate guess. Plus in 30 years, hopefully our daughter is no longer living with us. I assume she'll be off on her own and she's, you know, 31 years old. Uh, so I started putting in the year of a 15 year mortgage. I felt like that was a little bit more realistic. So 2250 a month at 4% interest at 30 years is a 471 loan. And that's just principal and interest, but doing it from a 15 year term, makes it a $300,000 house. So the only way I'm able to calculate is saying, okay, if we're able to afford or want to spend on a house, you know, a $400,000 house, I'd be willing to spend up to $300,000 more to have all of these, I'll say, benefits and amenities. Now, I don't want to buy a $700,000 house because that's pretty expensive, but that's kind of the math I'm looking at. What are your thoughts, Charles? I think, you know, we've talked about this obviously offline a lot, and I think this makes sense for you, for what you want to do. It makes perfect sense, um, but not necessarily financially. I mean, maybe yeah. financially, but I just keep leaning towards who cares about the finances, you know? You get along with your mother-in-law, your wife gets along with her mother, you want to have a family in the same place. I think it's terrific, and the numbers are, are great and help bolster what's the right decision for you and your family. And if anyone out there listening to this, whether now on the recording, if you guys have been through this, you know, doing a mother-in-law suite with having a relative live in, got insight, I am all ears. Please email me, reach out to me. If anyone else on the call has insight, I would love to hear it. Because um, this is, I'm just, you know, I'm having a fun time with this. And, you know, just it's very hard to balance these things. And I see a few congratulations out there from people for, uh, having our first child, so thank you guys, I appreciate that. All right, I don't see many comments on here, so I take it I got people stumped. All right. So Charles, moving on. Oh, I do have one more comment on here. Andrew says, don't forget to include a larger vacation fund. You and the mother-in-law <laughs> will need breaks. That is a good point. Uh, great. Thank you, Jessica. She says, you're lucky to have such a great mother-in-law. And Andrew says, I've been in your shoes. I might be emailing you after the webinar, Andrew. So FYI. So Charles, uh, let's see someone, let me look at his name. So Eugene Stan, one of our uh, email subscribers, emailed this article in a couple weeks ago to me. Uh, and it was titled, Did House Flippers Cause the Market Crash 10 Years Ago? And actually I had a, actually had a research paper it referenced, and I'll post the link to the, in the show notes. But here's a snippet of it, and it says, Analyzing a huge data set of anonymous credit scores from Equifax, the economists found that the biggest growth of mortgage debt during the housing boom came from those with credit scores in the middle and top of the credit score distribution. 
and that these borrowers accounted for a disproportionate share of defaults. As for those with low credit scores, the subprime borrowers who supposedly caused the crisis, their borrowing stayed virtually consistent throughout the boom. And while it's true that these types of borrowers usually default at a relatively higher rate, they did not after the 2007 housing collapse. This new paper's investigation into the habits of the middle and upper income real estate speculators in the run-up of the crisis marks yet another chapter of the history books in desperate need of revision. So pretty, uh, pretty strong article there. My initial thoughts are it's very hard to have, you know, pinpointed on one smoking gun, but I wasn't in the real estate game 10 years ago. Um, Charles, you've lived through it. You were an agent through there. You got any thoughts or insight on this article or is this just another uh, great headline? You know, as always, it, it's the gray area is where it is, and that's the truth. So, yeah, I lived through this era. I, I read the article, um, and I understand what they're saying. The danger with actually understanding um, statistics is that you can convince anybody of anything. If I wanted to convince you that our Denver housing market was about to crash, I could probably do that. Uh, hold on one second. Sorry, my heat just kicked on. It was going to get loud. Um, Here's, here's the good and the bad. The good is these are probably very smart economists and they absolutely make a point that a contributing factor to what happened was speculation. Of course it was. They're right. No question about it in my mind. But the idea that they, that they named the article, did house flippers cause the market crash, is just so incredibly unprofessional. It's just immoral. It's just stupid. If I could look at the economist now, I would say, come on, dude, really? This is what you needed to do? Well, maybe you're right. Maybe it was your editor that made you actually change what you wanted to call the article as a serious research study into something stupid, like saying that house flippers caused the crash. Of course they didn't. There was a lot of incredibly complex contributing uh, factors that, that caused the crash um, and we can go on and on about that. But no, it wasn't, of course it wasn't house flippers, but no question that when there was speculation and when the bubble burst, that without question contributed to the downturn. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that it is way more complicated than this just completely unprofessional, ridiculous headline. Uh, and if you want to get into it, learn more about it. Send me an email. I'll, I'll refer some great books about this that I've read to try to understand better what happened and what we're going through and what it'll take to go through this again. But but don't believe a, a silly byline like this. It's just, it's just a waste of everybody's time. All right. So great headline, week on the data. I see a few people commenting that, uh, yes, uh, they agree with your comments, Charles. So uh, wrap it up here since we're getting on the hour mark. And I know you've got a few meetings later today, Charles. Let's uh, jump ahead. Couple upcoming events, and these are actually classes that you're teaching, Charles. So give people a quick rundown on these. Uh, so Denver Metro Real Estate Market Trends, um, it's one of my favorite classes that I love to teach, talking about what is happening in the real estate market for two hours, really gets into the statistics, and I give you my best guess on, you know, where we are and where we think we're going. Understanding it's a guess, it's speculation, but, you know, we're seven years into this upturn. The short answer is I don't see any data or evidence saying it's going to change anytime soon. Come to the class, argue with me. We'll both have fun. And then investment property analysis spreadsheet. I'm going to be teaching this with Joe Massey. And we're going to be looking at two different spreadsheets we put together. Um, if you have even an inkling of wanting to understand numbers and how to use spreadsheets to be a better investor, it won't be complicated, but it'll be really really, really interesting. Joe will be teaching it with me. He's phenomenal at this. He, he worked these spreadsheets out. Um, I think really good use of your time. And as always, the more we give, the more we get. So I would love to have you come free of charge, all that kind of stuff. All right. And uh, the first class is this Monday, October